Okay, Perfect. tomorrow we'll speak about operational resource theory of imagine imaginarity, and now time is yours. Okay. Well, hello everybody. I hope you're well, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for organizing um, this interesting conference and sessions in a difficult time, and also for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, so, as you can see from the title of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, a resource theory for imaginarity and imaginary numbers in quantum mechanics. Uh, I am Carlo Maria Scandolo from the University of Calgary, if you've never met me before. So, uh, essentially, we can, we can, let's say, trace the motivation for this study back to a deep question question of quantum theory, the fact that we have complex numbers that are uh, part and parcel of the formalism for describing uh, quantum systems, because we have complex silver spaces. We also see the presence of the imaginary unit in the famous Schrodinger's equation. However, uh, we also know that even classical systems, uh, for example, classical waves or oscillations in general, can be described using complex numbers. So now the question is, are complex numbers just a mathematical artifact of the formalism we use to describe quantum theory, or is there anything more to them? So just a tool, or is there a deep meaning? So to answer this question, let's say we... Um, we approach it from a resource theoretic perspective. Uh, resource theories have always been very useful in uh, finding the solution of, uh, of deep problems in, in, the, in quantum information. For example, you know, think quantum entanglement, quantum thermodynamics. So here we use, uh, we develop a resource theory of imaginarity. Specifically, it was introduced by Hickey and Gore. And here I'd like to recap some of the basic features of this resource theory because it's not well known. So the idea behind it is that uh, it's very similar to what happens when we are dealing with uh, coherence. So in coherence, we know there is a preferred basis and even here we have a preferred basis. But instead of considering um, states that are diagonal and that, um, that basis as free states, we, are, we say that free states are those density matrices that are real in that fixed basis. And contextually, free operations are those quantum channels, or later on I'll also talk about more general quantum operations, where the, uh, their Krauss operators are real in that basis. And if you don't like Krauss operators because they are somehow arbitrary, uh, well, we can use something uh, like the Choi matrix. So the Choi matrix of, of these channels is real. Okay. So uh, let's see what we know from the, this work by Hickey and Gore. As I said, it's very useful to recap what we know in order to understand what's, what to do next. So a very interesting feature of this um, resource theory is that every pure state, regardless of the dimension of the Hilbert space in which it lives, is equivalent as a resource, so I can convert it back and forth, let's say, uh, to a pure qubit resource. So this works for pure states. So in other words, pure resources are all equivalent to qubit. So essentially qubit is, describes everything that, that happens at the pure level. And from this point of view, uh, we know that the maximum resource is the state plus i, which is described here. You can see it's very similar to the maximally coherent state, right? But now there is a very interesting feature because, as I told you, uh, the dimension doesn't matter. So I cannot, uh, let's say, use arguments like based on you know having many copies or something like that because if I have many copies of the maximum resource, it's like having a single one. So nothing happens in this case. So we have to develop something slightly different in order to study this resource theory than what we're used to, do, to doing. Um, and then the, that paper by Hickey and Gore also identified one significant monotone, which is called M here. So it's essentially defined as the minimum distance of a state from the set of real states. So this uh, script R means the set of real states. 
And this distance in this case is measured with a with a trace distance, so with the one norm. And you see they computed this closed form for this monotone. This monotone is important because it's also um, sufficient monotone for the conversion of pure state. So I can convert a pure state psi into another one, also pure, if and only if, right? There's also the if part. Uh, the uh, the value of this monotone in the former state is greater than or equal to the value of the monotone on the latter state. So now, please keep this monotone in mind because this will come back in later in the talk and will essentially tell us something uh, something more. So this monotone is actually something else, not just uh, simply this sort of minimum distance as well. Okay, so now let's see briefly what the structure of this talk will be. So I'm going to start first talking about the state conversion problem. So how, if I'm given two states, how do I decide whether there is, one can be converted into the other? Then I'm going to talk about uh, monotones. And finally, I will present a protocol based on local state discrimination, which shows that imaginary numbers are actually crucial in quantum theory, and they actually are a resource in, in this type of protocol. And then I will briefly also talk about the experimental implementation of this protocol here, because we were in this work, we are also able to collaborate with an experimental group and they checked what uh, essentially the theoretical findings and they, 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 with an optical experiment. Okay, so let's start from state conversion. So we saw that we have the state conversion for pure states, right? We were able to solve it with a necessary and sufficient condition for arbitrary pure, for pure states. Now, the problem is was that we, we are still missing the, the conversion of mixed states. So in our work, instead of solving the conversion for all possible mixed states, we attack the problem by focusing on qubit, mixed qubit states, so generic qubit states. So in order to understand what the condition looks like, so what we do here, we write the two states, we want to convert one into the other, uh, in terms as a linear combination of the Pauli matrices. So in other words, this um, you see that rho has these R coefficients, sigma has these S coefficients, and so essentially this R and S is, are essentially two, the, the block vectors of these two states. So we have, then we are able with, um, let's say, similar techniques to those used in a similar problem in coherence, we are able to prove this uh, result here. So essentially, we can convert rho into sigma if the entries of the block vectors of these two states satisfy these inequalities. Now, some of you may notice here that we may have a problem because we have denominators here. We have S at the denominator, we have R at the denominator. So maybe what does it mean? I mean, to have this formula, so it might be not so well defined. However, I mean, if you check the, the proof of the theorem, then it, everything works out and we can present the condition in this form provided we make this um, sort of uh, convention in when we have expression. This will also be valid later on for another expression I'm, I'm going to present. So essentially, whenever we are dividing anything that is non-negative by zero, okay, we conventionally state that this thing is plus infinity. So, so what does it mean? Because essentially, if you see that when the S uh, component here is zero, then the state is real because it lacks the sigma y component, which carries the imaginary unit, right? So in, in other words, you see that if the target state sigma is real, okay, so this thing is zero here, then essentially the second uh, condition is always satisfied and the, the first one as well, right? Because you see that now you have uh, the square is greater or equal to zero, obviously. And then the uh, in this case, here we have plus infinity greater than or equal to something else. So this tells us, so this is in agreement to our intuition that whenever we have a real state and uh, sigma is real, then the conversion is possible. And indeed, this is captured by those inequalities. Okay, so um, let's uh, uh, present the idea graphically here. So this can give an idea of what's going on. So so here you see there's uh, some dots here. There's a red dot, a blue dot, and a green dot here on the top, uh, sorry, on the bottom left. So the 
a red area is the set of states that is generated by real operations starting from the red dot. The blue area is the set of states that is generated by real operations starting from the blue dot, and the green one is the set generated from the green dot. Okay, notice something here, because you see that these sets here all agree on the line. Uh, I forgot to mention that, in fact, this we should... Um, so this is actually the projection or the section on the uh, um, YZ plane, right? On the uh, on the YZ plane in the block uh, in the block space, like when you have the the block sphere, the block ball. Then this is uh, what happens. So if you you should imagine these um, these um, shapes here as a three dimension, and just rotate this figure. Um, through the z axis and you'll have this three dimensional picture so i want to say that you see that these shapes all agree on the line it's actually a plane because it's three dimensional right um you you see here that associated with sy equal to zero so sy equal to zero are all the real states because sy is the component uh, associated with sigma y Right, so they all agree here. So these are all the real states. So this tells me that I can always reach the real states with respect to where I start. And notice that the distance of a point from this real plane is actually somehow a quanti it's it's a quantifier of how real a state is. And you see that in fact this uh, real operation cannot increase the distance. You see that something here gets sent at most to something that has the same distance as the original one. Just to understand how this picture works. Okay, so sometimes uh, we cannot convert rho into sigma deterministically. What do I mean deterministically? I mean with a quantum channel. But maybe we can go probabilistically. What does it mean probabilistically? That essentially, instead of having a quantum channel, we have a quantum operation with that's part of a quantum instrument. So in other words, we are able to convert rho into sigma if we can find a non-zero probability such that this quantum operation outputs um, sigma up to a rescaling, let's say, a probabilistic rescaling. And essentially this P is the probability uh, by which I obtain uh, the conversion. So it's interesting to calculate the maximum value for this probabilistic conversion. Why? Because it tells us a lot of information. If this maximum value, maximum value is 1, then the conversion is possible with a quantum channel, which means deterministically. If that maximum value is zero, then the conversion is not possible at all. And if it's something in between, then it means that the conversion is not possible deterministically, but can be achieved probabilistically. Okay? So in this case, we were able to find uh, a closed formula for the maximum probability, a conversion probability of any pair of pure states in any dimension. And it's given, again, by an expression containing a denominator here, so we have to use the same convention. So essentially, this maximum probability is given by the minimum between two numbers, one concerning this inner product between psi and its conjugate, complex conjugate, complex conjugating all, all the coefficients in that fixed basis, and one, essentially, because this the first term here can be also greater than one in principle. Right, notice that whenever phi is real, clearly phi star is equal to phi, then phi uh, bracket phi is actually uh, 1, so we see that the denominator is 0, so we get that the, essentially um, here the first term is plus infinity, the other one is, zero, is 1, so therefore the probability, uh, the maximum probability is 1, so it tells me that I can always convert. But this is obvious, because if phi is real, if the target state is real, I can always go, because I can always go from any state to a free state in a resource theory. Therefore, I mean, this uh, th the result of this theorem actually captures that case. So let's say it's in agreement with our intuition in that respect. OK, so after this uh, presentation of the uh, state conversion problem, let's turn to examining a couple of monotons. The first one we consider is the robustness of imaginarity, which is, as always, defined as the minimum uh, weight with which we need to mix something with the original state in order to go to the free uh, set. And here uh, we want to mix the original state rho with something, some an another 
quant generic quantum state. We're not requiring sigma to be free because that's another type of robustness. So here it's generic quantum state. Well, we find that if we do the calculation of this, it actually requires quite a bit of, of, of work in order to, to show that. Um, but eventually we find that this closed formula for the robustness of, of imaginarity, does this remind you anything? Well, yes, because this is the monotone that was introduced in the work by Hickey and Gore, where uh, the monotone associated with a minimum distance from the, the set of free states. So the robustness of imaginarity in this case coincides with the minimum distance calculated with the, with the one norm. Now, again, here we want just to briefly hint at a problem we face when we want to start, for example, studying the distillation problem. So we want to distill imaginarity, so the maximally imaginary state, the most resourceful state here. However, we want to, of course, quantify how well we can do it, but now we cannot use the usual trick of having many copies of a state because having one copies of many copies, it doesn't, doesn't change in terms of resource, nothing happens. So from this point of view, we prefer actually to consider something slightly different, which is the fidelity of imaginarity. So essentially it quantifies how, how close we got we get with the, with the real operation R to the maximally imaginary state. So we maximize this, uh, the fidelity, which is calculated here, over all possible real operations. And again, with a little bit of effort, we can show that uh, this fidelity of imaginarity is closely related to the robustness of imaginarity, again, because it's simply given by rescaling of the robustness of, the robustness of uh, imaginarity. Cool. And finally, we go to the final part of this talk, where I'm going to show a protocol uh, where the role of imaginarity in quantum theory as a resource becomes clearer. Okay, the first uh, uh, person who noticed that uh, real numbers have something to do, and complex numbers have something to do with the uh, sort of local discrimination of states was uh, William Wooters. And he noticed that essentially some states cannot be become, let's say, tomographically indistinguishable uh, if we want to do local tomography. So here we want to, let's say, make a stronger version of the result by Wooters, and then also to test experimentally. So again, we focus on LOCC state discrimination. What do we mean by this? So essentially we have two parties, two distant parties as standard theory of entanglement, and they want this time to discriminate between two, in this case, we, for simplicity, we restrict to two bipartite quantum states. So we want to identify which state was prepared using an LOCC protocol. And uh, okay, so we have these uh, states, rho j, that are, and, we, and uh, in particular, we want to see what happens for a, the particular class of states where these rho j's are LOCC perfectly distinguishable. What does it mean? It means that we can find an LOCC POVM, of course, which has this uh, sort of separable structure, such that this POVM is able to identify with certainty which state was prepared, because clearly, uh, it gives probability one only on one state and zero on the other, essentially. All the, the various the POVM elements are, have this property here. Okay? So now we know from um, standard quantum theory that orthogonal pure bipartite states are LOCC perfectly distinguishable, and I'm always talking about pairs. Okay? Right. Now the question is, what happens when instead of having generic quantum states, we uh, pick states that are real and also POVMs that are real? So we, we are able to show actually here that uh, using a similar argument to the one by Walgate and others, that again, even with this restriction, if we have pure bipartite states and real uh, real, sorry, real pure bipartite states and real POVNs, we are able to discriminate them perfectly, okay? Um, 
uh, using using a real operation in classical uh, communication, LRCC, real, essentially. We replace the letter O with letter R to say that it's real. We can still do it. So maybe if we want to see something more, uh, let's say, curious, we need to move to uh, mixed states. So this is how... This is what we find. So let's focus on this pair of mixed states. So just uh, the identity plus uh, the uh, uh, sigma y tensor sigma y component and minus in the other case. Well, in, in uh, let's say quantum theory without any restrictions. So if we are allowed to use uh, all possible um, POVMs, okay, these are perfectly distinguishable. Um, just to say, I forgot to mention that these two states are real because sigma y is not real, but sigma y tensor sigma y is real because essentially the imaginary unit in the first tensor factor gets compensated by the imaginary unit in the second tensor factor, and therefore we have a real matrix here, just uh, just to specify. And yeah, this is a, 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 a an LOCC POVM that works in uh, in uh, let's say without any restriction be, uh, that discriminates perfectly between these two states. Uh, notice that here these uh, the local elements are imaginary because I, I need to measure with uh, plus i and then minus i, you see? So this is definitely something that is not locally real, okay? So now let's see what happens if, if I want to discriminate these two states that are perfectly distinguishable using uh, instead real P, uh, L, uh, real LOCC POVM, LR, LRCC POVMs, okay? So in this case, you see that A and B must be real and symmetric matrices. So notice that, okay, remember that we are working with states that contain a sigma y tensor sigma y component, and but if A is real and symmetric, whenever I take the trace of this thing, the and whenever I multiply a real and symmetric matrix by sigma y, I get zero uh, if I, when I take the trace. So in, in other words, the, the component uh, with the sigma y tensor sigma y gets completely invisible. So in other words, these two states, when I apply the, these POVM elements, always give the same, the same probability out of it. So really, there's nothing that allows me to discriminate between the two. I cannot distinguish them, not even imperfectly, maybe some has more probability than the other. No, they have exactly the same probability, so I'm not able to discriminate at all between the two. So I just need to guess what's going, going on. And notice that this is even uh, m more, uh, sorry, um, interesting because it's enough that only one part, one of the two parties has uh, is restricted to uh, real measurements in order to make these two states indistinguishable at all because it's just the fact that the trace of AC times, times sigma y is equal to zero. So in other words, you see that having access to imaginary numbers in the form of sigma y in this case, really allows us to discriminate between states that otherwise wouldn't be possible. So in other words, uh, discriminate these two states locally, I, I should add. Right, so um, in, in this sense, you see that imaginary numbers are a resource and they're not just something that is there because of its it's uh, convenient from a mathematical point of view, something that really matters from a practical point of view. So very briefly, talking about the experiment. So the experiment was done with uh, in quantum optics. I won't go into the details because I'm not an experimentalist. And yeah, my, my uh, description will be definitely imprecise. So what happens here is that we have a source of photons that are entangled here. You see this, some, one photon goes, two photons essentially, one goes up, and this is, let's say, Alice's part, and the other one goes down. And essentially here we manipulate with interferometers the state locally in order to prepare the desired state, and then we, do, we measure and we do a coincidence count. So these are the results, which are totally in agreement with the theory. So this is a plot of a guessing probability. So, so the, what's the probability of guessing the state correctly? So if I'm not able to discriminate between those two states, I need just to toss a coin, so just the probability will be one half. So here, this is what you see. In in the X coordinate, you see the, um, the the observables that are measured. So instead of doing POVMs here, we do log measurements of local observables, that are sigma X, sigma Y, and sigma Z. 
those that are real are not all possible combinations. Uh, so sigma x tends to sigma x, z tends to z, so on, uh, z, x tends to z, and vice versa. And curiously, we have also sigma y tends to sigma y, which is a global real observable, but not a local one. So it cannot be measured locally. Indeed, if I um, if I can only perform local real measurements, then I'm restricted to the yellow part of this plot. And you see that with the experimental errors here, but I'm more or less around one half as predicted by the theory. If I want to discriminate these two states, I can still do them, discriminate them perfectly using, let's say, only real operations, okay? But these the real operations are not in the LOCC form, must be something global, okay? So not, not localized like that. So let me conclude then. So what did we do in this work? We explore the imagine, imaginality as a resource and using the formalism of resource theories, we found necessary and sufficient conditions for the conversions of arbitrary states for two-dimensional systems and the maximum conversion probability in the case of pure states in arbitrary dimension. Uh, we presented some expression for monotones and we showed with the protocol that imaginarity is actually a resource when we discriminate uh, states locally. And I want to just conclude with a sort of more foundational notes is that the presence of imaginary numbers limits the amount of holism we, we have in quantum theory. So people say quantum theory is a holistic theory with imaginary number is actually less holistic than it could be because we can still discriminate state locally but if we only have real numbers, there are some states that can only be distinguished perfectly using a global real measurement, not an LOCC one. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll, here are some references. Great, um, thanks Carlo for a nice talk. Is there any question for Carlo? Hi, Carlo Maria, uh, yes. it's Yuji here again. So, uh, yeah. Right, yeah, so uh, let me ask you a quick technical question, maybe. Uh, your free operations of uh, physical operators are real. Uh, is that strictly smaller than the maximal set of free operations that conserve the uh, real state or uh, coincides with it? Very good question. So it depends on how you phrase the, 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 the question. It was uh, already shown in the Hickey and Gould paper. So if you just require the operation to be a resource non-generating, then this uh, set of resource non-generating operation is larger than the set of real operation I consider. However, if I consider the set of completely resource non-generating, so those that don't generate resource even when, you know, tensoring, um, then this is pre precisely coincides with the set of real operation I, I define here. So essentially, with the, the, the resource theory of imaginarity, you know that Let's say the completely. Let's build a parallel, um, a parallel with the resource theory of coherence. Mm -hmm. In that case, you know that have, we have mio, uh, pio, and uh, io incoherent operations on the various classes, right? So you can say that completely mio. So the max, the completely maximally real operation, completely maximally, you know, uh, right? The set of physically implementable uh, ima uh, real operations. So those that have a uh, real dilation in other words okay and those that uh, are that essentially preserve real states even stochastically even at the level of the single Krauss operators mm -hmm. they all coincide so they all collapse so in the resource theory of coherence they are separated but in the resource theory of imaginarity they all collapse in the same notion which here we call real operations mm -hmm. is there any even operational difference between the maximal set and the completely free operations um, well, yeah, there, there are some, some, of course, there are some operations that are not, not inside. There, there is an example in, in that paper there. Um, let's say that from my, uh, from my point of view, I always prefer the complete resource non-generating because they are, let's say, physically more motivated. On top of that, there is another more interesting uh, connection that the completely resource non-generating ones are, how to say, those let's say, that can be viewed as a, a sort of, um, how to say, that you can we can view that theory of completely resource non-generating real operation, um, we can view it as 
quantum mechanics in a real Hilbert space. So if you replace a complex Hilbert space with a real one, so over the real field, essentially you find a theory that's completely equivalent to working with a complex Hilbert space and just focusing on the um, completely resource non-generating real operation. So there's also this nice, let's say, connection from a mathematical perspective. Okay, thanks. Good. Um, due to the time limits, so maybe we move more discussion to the Slack channel and move to the next talk.